Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala All praise is due to Allah And may his peace and blessings be upon his final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam O you who believe, fear Allah the fear that he is deserving of you And die in the state of Islam In the state of submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is my pleasure to be with you here tonight with my brothers here in the HIYC in Melbourne. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from you and us our efforts and for dedicating your time to come and to listen to a gathering of knowledge and remembrance of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِّن بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهِ Then not a people gather in a house of the houses of Allah reciting the book of Allah and studying it between them except that Tranquility descends upon them and they are overcome by mercy and the angels surround themselves around them and Allah mentions them with those with Him in paradise, with the high angels. So your effort and your gathering here is a gathering that is witnessed by Allah and the angels, is a gathering that is loved by Allah is a gathering that earns you the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a great gathering when we find so many Muslims, so many people outside, they'd be gathering on a night like this in other places. Gathering in places of play and amusement. Gathering in places of sin and wickedness. 
But Allah has witnessed your gathering here that you have gathered for the sake of Allah. To listen to words of remembrance, to, to listen to the words of Allah and to study it and analyze it and benefit, benefit from it. So may Allah accept from us our righteous deeds. It is important for a Muslim to understand and estimate the actions that he is doing and appreciate the blessing of Allah upon him who has given him the ability and given him the tawfiq to do such good actions. Because so many people have been deprived. And so you should count yourself fortunate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to recognize Allah's favor upon you, has given you the ability to show thanks for Allah's grace upon you. So thank and praise Allah for His blessings and the blessing of guidance and the blessing of being given the ability to, to worship and obey and thank Allah for His blessings. We have chosen to share with you today some verses from Surah Ali Imran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says commanding the believers after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the believers to avoid some major sins. And the major sin in particular that Allah commands for the believers to avoid is the sin of riba. What is translated to mean usury or interest. Which has become so prominent today in today's society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal amanu لا تأكل الربا أضعافا مضاعفة. O you who believe, do not consume interest multi multifold and multiplied. And fear Allah. واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون. And fear Allah, perhaps you will be shown mercy. واتقوا النار التي أعدت للكافرين. And fear the fire that has been prepared for the disbelievers. And obey Allah and His Messenger so that perhaps you can be shown mercy. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses commands the believers to avoid sin. And in particular, to avoid the sin of interest and usury. And He says that these actions lead a person to be punished in the hellfire. And the hellfire isn't for a believer. The hellfire isn't for a, a, a believing person to be. But rather Allah has prepared the hellfire for the disbelievers. But if the believers do not avoid major sin, then they may find themselves in the place that was designed and designated for the disbelievers. That is the hellfire. So you, O oh believer, don't belong in the hellfire. So protect yourself from falling into the hellfire by avoiding these sins. And so rather what you should do is obey Allah and His Messenger. And so Allah doesn't leave us without any guidance. He shows us ways to obey Allah and His Messenger. And how to save ourselves from the hellfire. And how to enter our souls paradise. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ And hasten and rush and race to the forgiveness from your Lord. Race and rush to the forgiveness from your Lord. وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And race and rush and hasten to earn a paradise. And this paradise, its width is that of the heavens and the earth that has been prepared for the muttaqeen. Those who protect themselves from sin, those who are pious, those who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who avoid the sins and the prohibitions that Allah had made forbidden. So let us analyze these verses in a little bit more detail. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا And rush and run. 
Allah commands the believers to rush and run to seek Allah's forgiveness. When it's a question of Allah's forgiveness, it requires you to rush and to run. Why is that so? If I had told you that there is something, you have to rush to get it. Why would you rush to get something? Either it is because that thing is, is only there for a short amount of time and then it's going to disappear. Or that you will only be, you will only have the opportunity to do that thing. You will only be existent for a certain amount of time and then you will lose the opportunity yourself. So rush to grab this forgiveness from Allah because it may escape you or you may lose the opportunity to gain it yourself. And if you don't rush, if you don't hurry, the forgiveness of Allah may pass you by. Or you may be cut short. If you don't rush to get the forgiveness of Allah, if you don't show some eager, some interest, if you don't show some energy and some concern to get the forgiveness of Allah, maybe you will reach a time when the forgiveness of Allah will not be existent anymore. Those things and those opportunities for you to earn Allah's forgiveness may not be apparent anymore. And inshallah, in, in later on in the examples, we'll give you some examples of how this may be. You may have a chance to do righteous deeds, but maybe that chance may not be, may not be existent. Or maybe you yourself will be deprived from that opportunity. Maybe your life will be cut short. And so, the door of forgiveness will be locked. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, that the door of forgiveness is opened. So as long as the sun doesn't rise from the west, and as long as you do not reach al ghargara when the soul reaches your throat. And who can guarantee this for himself that maybe you may delay forgiveness delay forgiveness not being so not showing so much interest not be, showing so much attention one day I'll repent one day I'll forgive I'll ask Allah for forgiveness one day I'll, I will come back to the path of Allah then maybe the hereafter may come or maybe still your life will end and your soul will reach its end point will reach your throat al ghargara and your life will be taken and you have lost the opportunity so the opportunity doesn't remain there forever you may have a window a small space of time so when you have a small space of time you must rush and you must run but now when we talk about rushing and running the average person today, if you find they're rushing and running and hastening, always in a rush, rush, rush. What are they rushing about? Rushing for the dunya. Rushing for work. Rushing to make more money. Rushing to buy a new house, to buy a new car, to buy better clothes. Always for the dunya. To rush and to, ru to race. This is why even in society, in, in Western society, they call the... The materialistic life, they call it the rat race. Have you ever heard this before? You know that a rat in the cage, it has a wheel. And the rat runs on the wheel and he thinks it's getting somewhere. But what's happening? Just going round and round in circles. And the faster the, the rat runs, it just doesn't go anywhere. It stays in the same position. It's just going around and around. This is what... Yani, in society, people talk about the rat race, the materialistic life. Just work goes on and on and never ends. The life of this world and your hopes and aspirations for the life of the world never end. We shouldn't be rushing in the rat race. We should be rushing in the race of the akhirah. This is what our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, commands from us. Then how about from our dunya? We shouldn't work. We shouldn't be concerned about making money. That is not true either. We should be concerned, but it should not be our priority in life. 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ هَمُّهُ جَمَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ شَمْلَهُ Whoever makes the akhirah his main goal, his main priority, Allah will bring together his affairs. وَيَرْزُقْهُ اللَّهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ and Allah will provide for him in a way that he doesn't imagine. وَتَأْتِيهِ الدُّنْيَا وَهِيَ رَاغِمَةً And the dunya will be brought to him by force. وَمَنْ كَانَتِ الْآخِرَةُ هَمُّهُ فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ جَمْلَةً فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ شَمْلَةً مَنْ من كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا هَمَّةً فَرَّقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ شَمْلَةً وَجَعَلَ فَقْرَهُ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ وَلَمْ يُؤْتَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَا كُتِبَ لَهِ And whoever makes the dunya the life of this world, his main priority, his main concern, Allah will dismember his affairs. Everything's all over the place. And he will make poverty before his eyes. Whatever, no matter how hard he works, he's always worried and scared that he's, it's not enough. He needs more, he needs more. He's like a poor man. It's never enough. He feels that he's, he's going to starve to death if he doesn't keep working. His, his main concern is the dunya. That Allah will make his affairs scattered. And Allah will make poverty be, before his eyes. And Allah will not give him of the dunya except what was written and prescribed for him. So the dunya, Allah has already set everyone's portion of it. This is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the dunya in Surah Tabarak, He said, He said that it is Allah who made everything in the earth subservient to you. Allah made everything for Bani Adam, for the human being subservient and under your control, easy for you to do. So walk in its bounds. Walk. In the Akhirah, what did he say? He said, rush and run. But for the dunya, he said, walk. Walk in its bounds. And eat from his provision, from the provisions of Allah that Allah has made for you. And remember, wa ilayhin nushur. And remember that your return is back to Allah. So be careful how you act in the dunya. Be careful what you consume in the dunya because your return is back to Allah and He will account you for your actions. So the point here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the dunya to walk. To walk in its bounds. Don't walk in the depths of the dunya. Don't engross yourself in the dunya. One of our mashayikh, he described, he said to us that the description of the, of the dunya is like a plate of honey. It's like a plate of honey. When the bee comes to eat from the honey, if it comes to the center of the plate, goes right, dives into the middle of the honey, what happens? It'll get stuck. And it, will, it will destroy itself. It'll die there, drowning in the honey. But if the bee comes to the boundaries, to the edges, of the plate and eats what it wants from the honey and then flies away. It won't get stuff. It can live another day. So likewise he said about the dunya, a person shouldn't engross himself in the middle of the honey plate. Or else he will be overtaken by the dunya. Don't make the dunya your main concern and your main priority. And the thing that you always worry and care about. But rather make the akhirah your main concern. Make the forgiveness of Allah, attaining the forgiveness of Allah, attaining paradise, saving yourself from the hellfire, make that your main concern, your main priority. And rush and work hard for that. Work hard to earn the forgiveness of Allah. And a paradise and a garden whose width is that of the heavens and the earth. You know the distance between the heaven and the earth, how high it is. 
how wide it is. The scholars, they said, if Allah describes that the, that the paradise will be so wide, then how long would it be? If the paradise is that wide, how long would it be? Would that paradise not be enough for you? Wouldn't you be satisfied with that paradise to live as a home? Today in the dunya we work so hard, maybe 30, 40 years for something even less than that. The paradise that Allah has prepared for the believer, its width is that of the heavens and the earth, its length is much more than that. Always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, you find many times in the Quran, Allah describes certain things about the Jannah, He describes the lower part of it. When He described the clothing of the people of Jannah, He said, بَطَائِنُهَا مِنْ إِسْتَبْرَقْ بَطَائِنُهَا مِنْ إِسْتَبْرَقْ Istabraq is, is not silk, it's the thick, expensive silk. This very thick, expensive silk, that will be the, in, the internal of the clothes. You know, when you have clothing, the inside usually isn't the good material. The good material, the nice material put on the outside. Imagine the clothing of Jannah, the inside material is istabraq, the thick silk. Then how would the outside be? If the inside of the inside of the clothes is a stabrak, then what would be what would you imagine the outside of the clothing to be? So if the width of the Jannah is that of the heavens and the earth, what what could you imagine the length of the Jannah to be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a for the muttaqeen. U'iddat lil muttaqeen. It has been prepared. The Jannah has been prepared for you. You don't have to go there, you know, you may, may, may move into a new house. But it's not about moving into the new house. You have a beautiful, maybe new house. But then you have to buy the furniture and move the furniture and the fridge and the clothing and the wardrobe and everything. No, no, no. In Jannah, you don't have to worry about any of that. It's already prepared. It's already arranged. The furniture is already put and the cushions are already aligned. The clothing is already prepared. Even the women of paradise are already in the house waiting for you to arrive. Uiddat, it's already prepared for you. You don't have to worry about calling the removal company. It's all prepared. You don't have to buy anything. Lil muttaqeen, prepared especially for those who have taqwa, for those who are pious, for those who are obedient to Allah. For those who avoid Allah's anger, this is the paradise. The paradise is not for the disbelievers. If a disbeliever comes and says to Allah, I'll pay you money, just let me go into paradise. With his money, with his power, with his army, no matter what he does, he can never enter paradise. Even if he owned everything in the heavens and the earth, if he gave as a price, as a ransom, he will never enter paradise and never be saved from the hellfire. But you, O Muslim, with just one word, with one phrase, La ilaha illallah, you will enter paradise. So how much value does this word have? How much does this word cost? If the kafir will pay every dollar he owns to buy Jannah and you buy it with La ilaha illallah, how much is La ilaha illallah worth? It's worth more than everything in the heavens and the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the paradise Allah had prepared for the muttaqeen. Just as he mentioned before that he made the hellfire for the kafirin, for the, for the disbelievers. So beware of doing actions that will make you fall into the hellfire because the hellfire is not for you, O Mu'min. The hellfire is for the kafir. And do actions that will make you enter the paradise because the paradise isn't for anyone. The paradise is only for the muttaqeen. How do we become muttaqeen? What actions can we do so that we can call ourselves muttaqeen so that we can have hope in entering this paradise? So that we can hope in attaining this prize from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the forgiveness from Allah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four things about the muttaqin. Four characteristics. The first characteristic he mentioned about money. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who give in charity, فِي السَّرَّاءِ When it's at ease, when their cash flow is good, when their accounts are in the green, in positive, when they have profits, when they have savings, when their financial situation is easy, they give in charity. And also, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ And also, the muttaqeen are those who give in charity for the sake of Allah, not only when it's easy for them, but also they give in charity when it's difficult. Sometimes you may be asked or encouraged to give in charity or donation for the poor, for a good cause, for the masjid, whatever it may be. And the shaitan may come to you and whisper to you, you know, you don't have a lot of money. Your financial situation is a little bit tight. Don't give. But the mu'min, he gives as much as he can. Even if it's a small amount. Because he remembers and he knows وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَهُ He knows and he remembers that no matter what amount of good deed, even the size of an atom's weight, he will see it on the Day of Judgment. And he believes and he knows it is maybe that small deed, that small charity, Maybe even the five dollars or the ten dollars. Maybe that will save me on the Day of Judgment. Maybe that will be the reason why my scale of good deeds will tip and become heavy. So the believer he gives for the sake of Allah in ease, times of ease and also in times of difficulty. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, he was asked, which is the best charity? Which is the most rewarding charity? He said, أَنْتَ تَصَدَّقْ وَأَنْتَ شَحِيحٌ وَأَنْتَ صَحِيحٌ شَحِيحٌ تَأْمَلُ الْغِنَى وَتَخْشَ الْفَقَرُ The best charity is to give charity while you are healthy and while you are stingy. You hope in becoming affluent and you fear poverty. The best charity is to give charity while you're healthy. There are a lot of people, when they're healthy, they don't give in charity. But as soon as they become sick, when they go to the hospital, please give this money to the masjid. Send, give charity. Maybe I'll become sick, maybe I'll become healthy. Dawu mardakum basadaka. Cure your sick by giving charity. Maybe he becomes sick, he fears that he's going to die. So he gives charity. This charity is rewarded. But the best charity, the most rewarding charity is for you to give in charity while you're healthy. Because the sick person, it's easy for him to give charity. The most rewarding charity is when it's hard for you to give charity. When you're healthy, you're not thinking about dying. So it becomes difficult for you to give up that money. But as soon as you become sick and you and you fear that you're going to die, then money doesn't have so much value in your eyes. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. He wants to see that those things that you value, you're ready to give it for the sake of Allah because you value the pleasure of Allah more than those things that you value. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not attain birr, righteousness and piety until you give from that which you love. So the believers, the first characteristic of them is that they give in charity. In ease, when it's easy for them and also when it's difficult. So be of the believers who give in charity even in difficult times. Even in times of ease, give in charity as much as you can. For the sake of Allah. For the pleasure of Allah. Just a final hadith about charity. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَا مِنْ يَوْمٍ يُصْبِحُ فِيهِ إِلَّا وَيُنَادِ مُنَادٍ Every day, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sends two angels. And each angel, he, Allah commands him to make a dua. And the first angel said, the first angel says, Allahumma a'ti munfiqan khalafa. The first angel makes a dua and he says, Oh Allah, give the one who gives in charity, give him in return. وَأَعْطِي مُمْسِكًا تَلَفًا And give the one who withholds his money from its right, give him destruction. Every day, Allah sends two angels. One makes dua for the one who gives in charity. And the other one makes dua against the one who withholds his money from its rights. So every day there is an angel making dua. So why not every day make a charity so that you can coincide with the dua of the angel that makes dua for you that Allah give you in return for whatever you give. Sometimes we are overburdened by giving. Everyone's asking this charity, that charity, this cause, that cause, this masjid, that masjid. Sometimes people become overburdened. and They say, I've already given, I can't give anymore. These are opportunities for you. Maybe one day these opportunities will pass you. And that time where you needed that opportunity, it will not be there anymore. Give for the sake of Allah as much as you can. No one is saying to empty all of your bank account and all of your pockets. Give whatever you can, whether it be a large amount or a small amount. Allah knows best your situation. So that is the first characteristic. The second characteristic that Allah mentions about the muttaqeen, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي الصَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَةِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَلِ النَّاسِ Those who withhold their anger. Those who withhold their anger. This is the second characteristic. A person by his nature becomes angry. It is not necessarily something bad to get angry. This is a natural characteristic. A human being that doesn't get angry, there's something wrong with him. It is natural and normal for a person to get angry. But what is important is that a person is in control of his anger. That when you get angry, you control your anger and you don't let your anger control you. And as well, that you get angry for the correct things, for the right things. You get angry over the religion of Allah. You get angry when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is disobeyed. This was the anger of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Man taqam al nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li nafsi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never showed retribution, never got angry for his own self. Illa an tuntahak hurumat Allah. Except if one of this one of the boundaries of Allah were transgressed and trespassed. Only when someone committed a sin, disobeyed Allah, did the Prophet ﷺ show anger over that. So likewise, we have to know when to show our anger and how to show our anger, to be in control of our anger and as well to show anger in its right proportion. This is something that Many Muslims, they are in need of to be in control over their emotions. We find a lot of Muslims, their anger leads them to do, to do unnecessary things, to do extreme actions. A Muslim must know how to put everything in its right place. Know when to show his anger and also know when to withhold his anger. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ كَذَمَ غَيْضًا وَهُوَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفِذَهُ مَلَأَ اللَّهُ صَدْرَهُ رِضًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever withholds his anger while he is able to execute it, while he is able to show it, while he is able to put it into practice, whoever withholds his anger while he is able to show it, then Allah will fill his heart with happiness on the Day of Judgment. Also in another narration of the same hadith, مَنْ كَذَمَ غَيْضًا وَهُوَ قَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفِذَهُ نَادَى عَلَيْهِ عَلَىٰ رُؤُوسِ الْخَلَائِقِ أَنْ يُخَيِّرَ مِنَ الْحُورِ الْعِينِ مَا شَاءُ Whoever 
withholds his anger while he is able to express it, Allah will call him out on the day of judgment from amongst the crowds to choose of the Hur al Ain whatever he whatever he pleases. What does it mean whoever withholds his anger while he is able to express it? Sometimes you could be angry. You could be angered. Maybe someone comes and hits into your car. And then he drives off. And you get angry but you say, no, no, I'm going to res restrain my anger. Because you have no other choice but to restrain your anger. He, he drove off, you, have, you can't do anything to him. What it means to restrain your anger Maybe that time the guy comes and hits your car and then you get out of your car and you grab him by his throat and you're ready to. But then you withhold it when you're able to express it. See, it's a different level here. It's a much more difficult challenge when you withhold your anger and you're able to express it, but you withhold it for the sake of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, that Allah will fill your heart on the Day of Judgment with pleasure, with rida, with happiness on the Day of Judgment. And the third characteristic, so the first characteristic was those who give for the sake of Allah in difficulty and in ease. And those, the second characteristic, are those who withhold their anger. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَةِ the third characteristic, and those who pardon people, those who forgive people. Maybe someone does something against you. Maybe he hurts you. Maybe he steals from you. Maybe he speaks against you. He does something to harm you. After you withhold your anger, you forgive. You pardon. As they say, forgive and forget. This is a level of Iman that is very high. Sometimes, if someone does something against you, you can withhold your anger. You can choose not to express your anger against that person. But you still feel hatred. You still feel enmity towards that person in your heart. But if you go even a step further and forgive and pardon, this is a higher level of Iman. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the end of the verse, Wallahu yuhibbu al muhsinin And Allah loves those who have Ihsan. And you know Ihsan is of the highest levels of Iman. The levels of Iman, you have Islam first, and then Iman, and then Ihsan. Ihsan is perfection of faith. And when a person lives his life this way, he is generous. The dunya isn't in his heart. He gives for the sake of Allah in ease and in difficulty. He withholds his anger. He pardons people. Wallahu yuhibbu al muhsinin. And indeed, Allah loves those who, who show perfection in their faith. Allah loves those who are generous and kind to others. This is all from Ihsan. So these are the three characteristics that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described. Those of taqwa, those who deserve the paradise. The fourth characteristic and final characteristic that Allah mentioned about them. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ The fourth and final characteristic. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً And they are the ones that if they ever commit an indecent act. فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Or they oppress themselves by committing a sin. First of all, we may be amazed. Could someone who commits an indecent act, someone who commits a sin, could he be of the people of paradise? Could, be he, could he be of these special people that Allah will admit into paradise? The answer is yes. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the believers sometimes, if, maybe, if by, by chance, by, yeah, by going against their habit, they may slip 
they may fall, they may fall into an indecent act or oppress themselves by committing a sin. So it is not from the habit of the people of paradise that they continuously do sin. Their habit is that they don't commit sin. But in the far off chance that they may commit a sin, what do they do? Immediately after committing the sin, they realize and they remember Allah. Dhakarullah. They remember Allah's favor upon them. Just as Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was tempted by the wife of the, uh, the, wife of the governor, Muratul Aziz, he immediately remembered Allah. Qala innahu, innahu rabbi ahsana mathway. He is my Lord. He has elevated my position. When you remember the favor of Allah upon you, when you remember Allah has given you so much, Allah has given you good health, Allah has given you wealth, Allah has given you a good family, Allah has given you, guided you to the hidayah, guided you to the guidance of Islam. When you remember the favors of Allah upon you, and then you think to yourself, you become ashamed after Allah has given me all of this. I go and I disobey Allah. I commit a sin. I commit an indecent act. I disobey Allah. Dhakarullah. As soon as they may fall, they may slip. They may fall. They may commit a sin. But immediately they remember Allah. Dhakarullah. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ At that point, immediately, they ask Allah for forgiveness. وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who will forgive your sin other than Allah? Is there anyone who can forgive your sin other than Allah? No one can forgive your sin other than Allah. When you realize that only Allah can forgive your sin, and you ask Allah alone to forgive you, then Allah will show you forgiveness. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith, that if a person commits a sin, and then he asks Allah to forgive him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ لِي عَبْدًا يَعْلَمُ أَنَّ لَهُ رَبًّا يَأْخُذُ الذَّنْبًا That my servant realizes that he has a Lord that punishes for a sin. He has asked me for forgiveness, so I will forgive him. And then he may commit a sin again. And they ask Allah for forgiveness. And Allah says to his angels, My slave realizes that he has a Lord who punishes for a sin. And so I've forgiven him. And then the slave may commit a sin again. And ask Allah for forgiveness. And Allah says, My servant realizes he has a Lord who punishes for a sin. And he has asked for my forgiveness. So I have forgiven him. Every time the servant commits a sin and asks Allah for forgiveness, Allah forgives him. Time and time again, the hadith mentions, it happens three or four times. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, testify my angels that I have forgiven him and let him do whatever he pleases. The problem isn't that a person commits a sin. The The problem is that a person commits a sin and doesn't race to repentance. And leaves the sin and delays repentance. But as long if you ever commit a sin, you race to ask Allah for forgiveness. Even if you commit that same sin again, ask Allah for forgiveness. You commit the same sin again, ask Allah for forgiveness. You commit another sin, ask Allah for forgiveness. Don't give up asking Allah for forgiveness. What does shaitan do? He comes to a person and he says, You committed that sin before. And you ask Allah for forgiveness and you promised Allah that you would never return to that sin. Now you've come to, you, you have come and you've done that same sin again. Don't you feel ashamed? How can Allah forgive you? Didn't you promise that you will never do that sin again and you've done it again? What are you trying to play with Allah? You're cheating Allah. Allah's never going to forgive you. This is what shaitan says to a person. To make him, to make him, shy away from asking for forgiveness. And so the person, when, when shaitan beats a person in this way, the person commits a sin and then he finds that it's useless to ask Allah for forgiveness. This is of the tricks of shaitan. But rather a believer should always recognize that his Lord is full of mercy. Inna rabbaka wasi'ul maghfirah. Indeed your Lord is so expansive in his mercy. His mercy 
ورحمتي وسعت كل شيء and my mercy and my mercy encompasses all things no matter how much you sin as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith al-Qudsi ya ibadi law balaghat dhunubuka anan as-sama ya ibn adam law balaghat dhunubuka anan as-sama thumma jitani la tushrik bi shay'a ghafartuha laka wa la ubali O oh, son of Adam, if you come to me with sins that reach the sky and you come to me asking for forgiveness, I will forgive it all for you and I wouldn't even care. So don't let shaitan put you off asking Allah for forgiveness. Even if you ask for forgiveness and you commit another sin and you ask Allah for forgiveness and another sin and another sin, Allah will continue to forgive you as long as you are consistent in asking Allah for forgiveness. But what is important is that you seek Allah's forgiveness immediately after you commit a sin and not to delay it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in hadith that anyone who commits a sin and goes and makes wudu perfectly and goes and prays two rak'ah without being distracted, focuses, prays these two rak'ah and focuses very well in his prayer and doesn't get distracted and ask Allah sincerely for forgiveness, Allah will forgive him. Did he say which type of sin? Major sin or minor sin? He didn't say. If you commit any sin, make wudu perfectly. Make sure you don't miss any part out. Then go and pray to Rukah, focusing and concentrating very well and ask Allah sincerely for forgiveness, Allah will forgive your sin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they are the ones that if by chance they may commit a sin, even an indecent action, fahisha, ذَكَرُوا they remember Allah, فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ They ask Allah for forgiveness from their sin. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَا يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And who is there to forgive them other than Allah? وَلَمْ يُصِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ and they are not insistent, they do not persist on that sin after they realize that it is wrong. So one of the conditions of the believers is that they, they are not persistent on the sin. Once they realize that they have committed a sin, they immediately ask for forgiveness. And they don't continue to do that sin without asking Allah for forgiveness. But every time a person commits a sin and asks Allah forgiveness, even if he commits that sin again and asks Allah forgiveness, this isn't called persistence. This isn't called israr. Because he has asked Allah for forgiveness. But israr, persistence on sin, is when a person continues to do the sin and doesn't ask Allah for forgiveness. So this is the fourth characteristic that if they commit a sin, then they turn immediately to Allah to ask for forgiveness. So these are the four characteristics of the muttaqeen. The ones who are generous in giving for the sake of Allah in, in times of ease and in times of difficulty. The ones who withhold their anger. Those who pardon others. And those who if they may fall into a sin, they are immediate in asking Allah for forgiveness. What is the reward of such people? For such people, their reward is forgiveness from their Lord. وَجَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ And many gardens with rivers flowing underneath them. Many type of rivers with different flavors of drinks. Different types of drinks. Allah described the rivers of paradise. That there are rivers of pure water. And there are rivers of pure wine. Wine in paradise that doesn't make them intoxicated but rather raises the spirit and increases their joy and their happiness and rivers of milk that never goes off and rivers of honey as pleasure for those who drink it many types varieties of drink for such people under these gardens Rivers will be flowing. Jannatin tajri min tahtiha al-anhar khalidina fiha abada. Allahu Akbar. They will dwell therein forever. They will dwell therein forever. They will never die. Their youth will never fade. They will never become old. 
and their Lord will continuously to be their Lord will continuously be pleased with them. And what a great reward for those who work and strive in good deeds. So work and strive for good deeds so that you can earn the paradise and the forgiveness of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to do these righteous actions and other righteous actions that Allah ta'ala is pleased with and righteous actions that will earn the forgiveness of Allah. Allahumma inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. سيدنا واغفر لنا ما مضى يا واسع الكرم يا ربي بالمصطفى بلغ مقاصدنا واغفر لنا ما مضى يا واسع الكرم هو الحبيب الذي ترجى شفاعته لكل هول من الاهوال مقتحم هو الحبيب الذي ترجى شفاعته لكل هول من الأهوال مقتحم يا ربي بالمصطفى بلغ مقاصدنا واغفر لنا ما مضى يا واسع الكرم يا ربي بالمصطفى